So I just want to start with an acknowledgement of country. So Melbourne Water acknowledged the Victorian traditional owners and their elders past and present as the original custodians of Victoria's land and waters. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the ongoing living culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'd also like to um, say welcome and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who we have joining us for the webinar today as well. So I'd just like to introduce Josh. So I'm sure many of you will actually know Josh, have heard of Josh. So he's a wildlife ecologist with, with the research group Caesar and Enviro DNA and he specialises in platypus research. So Josh is going to discuss his work today on platypus over the last 13 years, including their conservation status and threats, and also about his involvement in running the Melbourne Water Urban Platypus Programme. So I will now hand it over to you, Josh, and say welcome. Thanks, Teresa. Just give me a, a second and I'll share my screen with everyone. Okay, so hopefully that's now coming up. Um, yeah. yeah, so as Theresa said, I am um, primarily a, a platypus ecologist. Um, I've been uh, over 13 years now, and a large part of that for the last decade has been leading this um, uh, monitoring program called the Melbourne Water Urban Platypus Program. Now, this is a really unique program. Um, Having long-term wildlife data is absolutely critical for us to understand what's going on with populations, but unfortunately it's, it's often very difficult. Um, a species like the platypus um, is almost unheard of. So the, the platypus program in Melbourne has been running for about 25 years now. Um, it encompasses a large number of different waterways and different habitat types, um, and there's really only one other long-term monitoring program in Australia, and that's uh, in a rural region in a very localised area. The data that we get from this Melbourne Water Program is, is quite... So I just want to take a bit of a step back, first of all, and just kind of remind people just how amazing these little critters are, because they are one of the most unique creatures on the planet, um, and that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy working on them. Um, but there's also so much that we still don't know about them, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But just to remind you, so platypus has always been a bit of a bit of a mystery. Um, they're a very unique-looking creature. They're that weird mix of part mammal, part bird, part reptile, and they've confused biologists for many years. And there's the famous story of when the early settlers came to Australia, the early white settlers. Um, they were really confused about the platypus, and they used to send them back to Europe. And there's a a very famous telegram of a biologist back in Europe taking to the skin that was sent to him with a pair of scissors because he thought it was a hoax. He thought it was different bits from, from various animals stitched together. And I think you can kind of see why he thought that. But, um, of course, we now know it's a, a real creature. Even after that, it took them another 100 years before they understood how this species reproduced. So, of course, the Indigenous people knew that, but um, the early settlers weren't paying much attention to them, unfortunately. And, of course, we now know it belongs to a very unique group of mammals called monotremes. Um, and there's only about four or five of them in the world, depending on who you speak to. Um, and, of course, they're egg-laying mammals. Um, so even within that group, platypus is unique. It's, uh, it's, it sits by itself within that group. The other species are all echidnas. And to give you an idea about what a platypus egg looks like, it's very similar to this, but this is actually an echidna egg because there's very few records of platypus eggs anywhere. Now, I'm sure a lot about the platypus biology is, is familiar to everyone, but I'm just going to do a quick run through about some of their key features because it's really relevant um, for what we talk about later in terms of what are their habitat requirements and what, and what things threaten them. So, of course, the primary thing they need is water. They are really well adapted to living in an aquatic system. They can only forage in water. Um, and a lot of their features, their, their webbed feet, their thick coats, just make them very well adapted to an aquatic habitat. Unfortunately, aquatic habitats are some of the most threatened in the world. And those are a lot of the things that, that uh, are affecting platypuses. 
Now, they're primarily nocturnal. It doesn't mean it's unusual to see one out during the day, but they spend about 75% of their time active during night. Um, when you do tend to see platypus, it's in those dawn and dusk periods, but you do occasionally see them out in the middle of the day. They're a very adaptable little critter, um, but they do primarily forage at night. When they're not active in the water, they rest in burrows um, and sleep in burrows in the banks. And so having stable banks, stable earthen banks that they're able to construct these burrows is one of their critical habitat requirements. There's a couple of different burrows. They'll have um, their general resting burrows that they have scattered throughout their, their range. They might have half a dozen of these that they'll share their time between. And they're pretty simple, a couple of metres long, um, simple little tunnels into the bank. However, around this time of the year, females are starting to um, dig their maternal burrows, the ones that they're going to lay eggs in. And these can be up to 25, 30 metres long, uh, which is a massive construction for a, a little critter that's only about a, a kilo big. Um, and the reason these things need to be so big is that one of these, when the uh, female platypus lays the eggs in that burrow, they need to be pretty constant temperature and constant humidity. They need to be protected from any predators that might be able to get into that burrow, but also cope with changes in water levels as well, because they're going to be stuck in that burrow for about three months until the young emerge, and they're completely dependent on their mother during that time. There's also quite a lot of size variation in platypuses. So there's sexual dimorphism, which means um, males are, are quite a bit larger than females and generally about 50% larger. Um, those sizes I've put up there are what we see around, around Victoria. So males sort of one and a half to two and a half kilos, females about one to one and a half, but they also vary across their range. So up in Queensland, you get these little toy platypuses. So far North Queensland and adult males only about a kilo. Whereas in Tasmania, the largest one I ever caught down there, and as far as I know, the largest one on record was about three and a half kilos and 66 centimetres long. He was huge. And that's to do with um, that latitudinal gradient is to do with temperature regulation. So in colder temperatures, in colder climates, you get larger animals because they're able to maintain their body temperature better. Now, one of the really important things about platypuses is that they're, they're a quite slow reproducing animal. So they're not like rodents or rabbits where populations can really fluctuate widely. Um, these animals breed once a year. So in Victoria, we're actually coming into breeding season now. About mid-August mid, uh, mid to mid-October is about breeding season for these guys. Females generally only produce probably one young in the wild, occasionally two. Um, and females don't breed every year. So if they've raised young one year, um, they often won't raise young the next year. So when populations do decline, which unfortunately we're seeing a bit, their, their recovery is very slow. And that's really critical to what we're, what we're seeing. And the other thing is, is that they're, they're kind of pigs. They don't really, they're not too fussy about what they eat. Um, but they do require a lot of food. So generally they, they eat about 25 to 30% of their body weight per day, but a lactating female will eat up to her entire body weight a day if she has to raise one or two young. So it's a lot of food and the kind of things they're eating are often quite small. So a lot of aquatic invertebrates, insect larvae, small crustaceans, worms, snails, pretty much anything. They've also been known to eat uh, small fish and fish eggs and even the odd frog bones being found in their diet as well. And the other thing that makes these guys really quite unique is that they're one of the few venomous mammals in the world. So males have this poison, uh, venomous spur on their hind leg, which isn't showing up, unfortunately. Um, the venom is really quite toxic. I don't know why that's not... There it is. Um, the venom is really quite toxic. In humans, it causes excruciating pain and a lot of swelling and our opiates, things like morphine, really have no effect on it. So certainly makes working with these guys that little bit more interesting. Now, one of the really, uh, I guess, concerning things about platypuses is that we don't have a good understanding of their true conservation status. So this is their distribution across Australia. They occur in a lot of different aquatic systems throughout Eastern Australia. Now, that distribution really hasn't changed in, since European settlement. So a lot of Australian mammals have gone extinct and had massive reductions in range. Platypus is thought to have escaped that, but more and more we're understanding that that's not the case. And the problem with that is that 
we really have no idea, a, a, a reliable way of estimating numbers of, of platypus, even at a local scale. So within that distribution, we don't know if numbers have um, declined by 50% or 90%, or even if they've increased, which I'm fairly certain they haven't. Um, but that really impacts our ability to understand their proper conservation status. And more and more, we're understanding that, yes, populations are declining, and we're finding um, localised declines and localised extinctions within that sort of broader distribution. So in recognition that we are starting to understand this a bit more, they were recently upgraded, if you want to call that, to near-threatened. Um, before that, they were actually a species of least concern, which I don't think anyone would, would agree with. Um, and I think their, their true conservation status is probably a little bit, um, little bit worse than that, probably around that vulnerable area. But we're trying to understand that at the moment. So why don't we know much about one of our most iconic creatures? Platypus are just incredibly difficult to work with in the field. They're, they're a really difficult species to study. They don't leave tracks or scats behind that we can um, look for. They're incredibly difficult to trap, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And also, you can't simply just go out to a waterway and look for them. If you are lucky enough to see them, you'll often just see them in the distance like this, which kind of looks like a stick just floating in the water. Uh, it's often uh, quite low light, uh, really difficult to see. They're very easily mistaken for this guy, which is our native Australian water rat, or Rakali. Um, look very similar from a distance. And often, as I mentioned before, they're often active at night. So poses a lot of problems in being able to accurately understand whether they're there just from visual surveys. So I might just have a quick break now. If there's any questions that are burning for anyone at the moment, Rich? Uh, yep, we've got a few uh, at the moment. Yep. So uh, first question is, what is the plural for platypus? <laughs> Most common question I get by far. Uh, technically, it's platypuses um, because the root of the word is Greek instead of Latin. Uh, if it was a Latin word, it would be platypi. Excellent. I have put platypodes in the chat because platypodes is actually strictly correct. Yes, but I don't think I'm going to sell that to anyone. So no, I don't think anyone uses it. <laughs> um, what are the levels? Oh, sorry. Would levels or the length of activity of the platypus be related to resource scarcity? So would they be more active in, um, more or less active in marginal habitat like urban streams? Uh, almost certainly, yes. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about how much food they require. And so obviously that's going to be related to how much they have to forage. So if you've got a highly productive area, they don't have to forage for as long to find that amount of food. But when you get lower quality habitat, they have to forage for a lot longer. And you even see that on a seasonal um, uh, basis as well. So in winter, when there's not as much food around, they might forage for a lot longer. And we've recorded these guys foraging for like 14, 18 hours straight. And when they're pregnant, are they for nine months or do they have a longer or a shorter time? Uh, okay, well, so technically they don't get pregnant. Um, the, they lay eggs. So the eggs are about the size of a five cent piece. Um, when they're laid, and they, they'll lay maybe one or two eggs, they, the eggs hatch in about um, 10 or 11 days. And then when they hatch, they're like a little pink jelly bean about, the, uh, about a centimetre long. And they are completely dependent on their mother for around three months. Um, but when they emerge after those three months, they basically look like an adult animal. They're about two thirds the size of an adult animal by the time they come out of the burrow. Great. Uh, how does more intense flooding affect them? And do you find plastic in them? Uh, we don't find plastic in them, um, but we certainly do find them tangled in litter in urban areas in particular, and even in rural areas, we certainly find that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what was the first part of that? Was that about flooding? Yeah, does more of intense flooding affect them? Yeah, so, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but certainly the timing of year of the flooding is important. So if you've got young in the burrow and you get flooding events, um, you'll certainly get uh, a lot of mortality of young because they, they simply can't leave those burrows. And if they get inundated or washed out, um, they just can't fend for oh, themselves. Know, That's one of the things like, that we, um, you know, this. we find that does affect them. Cool. Uh, were they considered as a least concerned species due to the lack of data about them? 
Yes, basically. I mean, it was based on the fact that that distribution hasn't changed um, without any knowledge of what's going on within that distribution. So, yes, they, they were classified as a species of least concern because we didn't have any data, and because they're, cla they're not classified as threatened, you don't get funding to collect that data. So it's a bit of a vicious circle. Um, over the last 20 years, and this program has been at the forefront of that to collect that data, we are understanding more and more about what's going on with those populations, and that's resulted in it being upgraded to near threat. Cool. Um, do they get impacted by pollution, or is it more to do with the food supply and the invertebrates that they have to, to feed on? Yeah, almost that. I'm Unless it's very, very toxic. But these guys, they're an incredibly hardy species. Um, but certainly the things they feed on are affected by poor water quality or pollutants. And so, you know, their food supply goes or declines, and that means that the area can't support as many platypuses. Thanks. Um, there's a comment here um, that someone's read recently. It's safe to assume that there is very low risk that these animals are directly killed or injured by bushfires. Um, and some researchers have consistently failed to find any evidence of fire impacts on platypus numbers or reproductive success. So do you have thoughts uh, on the impact of bushfires on platys? Uh, yep. Um, so first of all, there hasn't really been any rigorous studies to understand the effects of bushfires. Um, there's been a couple of attempts where people, after fires have gone through, they'll go back into an area and find that platypuses are still there and conclude that there's been no impact. But unfortunately, there's never any pre-fire data. So even if they're still there, there could have been twice as many or 10 times as many beforehand. So that's one thing. Um, I would say that they're almost certainly not as affected as, say, terrestrial species. Um, they will mostly be buffered from the immediate impacts of fires. So they're not going to get burnt like those horrible pictures of koalas that we've all seen recently. Um, but the problem is once those fires go through, they're left in a very barren landscape. And we saw um, this year uh, a heap of rainfall after those rain fires, which just washed a lot of ash and sediment into those waterways. And again, it's not going to affect the animal directly, but it's going to smother their food supply. And some of the waterways that I saw post bushfires, I couldn't imagine anything living in them. There was mass fish kills. Um, and again, once their food supply goes, they've either got to migrate out of that area or they're going to starve to death. So we don't properly understand it, but I, I, can, I find it difficult that the recent bushfires had no impact on them. So I think that's a dangerous assumption without any data to back it up. Yep. And we had another question that was kind of related, asking about uh, the current condition of the rivers in far east Queensland that could be affected. So Snowy River and Cabbage Tree Creek. So probably a very similar kind of situation uh -huh. for those systems. Yeah, so we're currently do some, doing some other projects trying to understand the impacts of bushfires. We were, I guess, lucky in a way that we had some quite extensive pre-fire data, which has never happened before. So um, hopefully in six months or so, I'll have some new data that I'll be able to present to people. And um, look, fingers crossed, I'll be able to say that there hasn't been much impact. Um, but yeah, we don't know until we look. Cool. Um, we've got a few more questions, so I might get through a couple more and then we'll leave the rest for the next uh, question break. Okay. Um, but yeah, for the next couple. Uh, so platypus close their eyes underwater. How good is their eyesight on top of the water? Um, yeah, good question. They're very good at seeing movement, but not so much at seeing shapes. So if you actually stand next to a waterway and don't move, they actually won't notice you're there. Um, as soon as you move, they pick you up very quickly and disappear. Um, I don't think their eyesight is great, but that, they don't tend to use it that much. So I can't imagine it's, it's, it's all that good. But yeah, they do pick up movement very well. Cool. Uh, if we monitor water pollution in real time and the data shows low pollution, can we expect their presence in creeks? Um, I... I would suspect that it's going to be more around long-term water quality. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's more about the impact on their food supply. So if water quality declines temporarily, it's not going to impact platypus as much. If it's, if it's poor over a long period, then it's going to impact their food supply. And, and then again, the animals are going to have to move out or starve to death. Having said that, I do find animals, I do find platypus in some very degraded waterways. And so you get, you can get macroinvertebrates that are quite pollutant tolerant and some that are quite sensitive. And so 
if the water quality de declines, you'll lose some of those invertebrates, but the pollutant tolerant ones can sometimes be there in quite high numbers. And because platypuses really aren't fussy, they'll eat whatever's there, they tend to be able to tolerate those conditions reasonably well. You certainly get lower numbers of animals, but um, yeah, they're really adaptable little creatures and can cope with a lot of different conditions. Cool. Uh, and the last one for this uh, block of questions, have you ever been envenomated? <laughs> That's my second most common question. Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't. Um, it's actually surprisingly easy to avoid um, once, if, as long as you know that it's there. I think the people that the few people that have been um, spurred before are, are probably unaware that they're venomous and, and just kind of pick them up, a sick or injured animal, and, and unfortunately end up in hospital for their trouble. So, uh, no, and I'm very grateful that I haven't. Excellent. Thanks for that. All right. Well, um, we'll leave the questions for there for now and we'll pick up some of these ones in some of the other breaks and maybe after uh, the end of your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we actually addressed some of the stuff I'm about to talk about. So I might zip through this next section. It's really about what are their, what are their threats? And so, you know, I've mentioned that we don't know much about platypuses and, you know, why are we really worried if their distribution hasn't changed a great deal? And because these guys are completely dependent on aquatic ecosystems and we know that these systems are under threat from a lot of different avenues um, the question remains like how how impacted have platypuses been and I'll just take you through so some of their major threats are going to be so um, their number one threat and we I should say we don't have a lot of good data about the relative impacts of these different threats and they're all going to interact and they're going to be at different scales in different areas but um, you know, logically, some of the major threats are going to be um, the way that we have altered flow regimes in waterways, and that is some things like drought, which we've all just experienced pretty recently, the worst drought on record in this part of the country. And so your waterways that were sort of nice, healthy, flowing rivers become these fairly stagnant, disconnected pools. Um, not hard to imagine that that impacts most things that live in that waterway. It reduces the amount of habitat that's available. It reduces the connectivity between those pools. It reduces food supply. It impacts that surrounding vegetation. So, you know, the drought was certainly a, a massive issue. Um, we tend to dam and build reservoirs to meet our own needs. So that completely changes the flow regime both up and downstream of those um, constructions. But then also that's a massive physical barrier for animals. And so you can imagine a poor little platypus trying to swim upstream there, comes up with this concrete wall. Um, platypus are quite unique and they will leave the water to move around them, but that also opens them up to predation. And so, you know, if it's not a complete barrier, it's at least inhibiting movement and fragments. You know, we build thousands of these in the landscape. So we're stopping water going into our rivers and streams as well. And then we directly extract from waterways as well. So I guess overall, we, we tend to be reducing um, the water that's available, reducing the habitat that's available and the types of uh, flow regimes that we get are drastically altered. Probably the other major threat that I, I sort of broadly categorise under habitat degradation, um, this is what a healthy platypus habitat looks like. It's you know, pretty reliable flowing water, relatively good water quality. There's lots of um, native riparian vegetation on the banks. So that holds those banks together so that they can burrow. Um, it dumps all this woody debris and organic matter into those waterways, which is food and habitat for their invertebrates um, that they eat. And then the bottom of these waterways tends to be a lot of different size rocks and cobbles and, and pebbles. And again, that's lots of nooks and crannies that all the bugs live in so there's a saying that sort of messy waterways are healthy waterways and, and that's what we want our waterways to look like something like that unfortunately we transform them into things that look like this now you know this is an agricultural area obviously but similar things occur in say forestry or uh, urbanization but one of the first things we do is we clear all that vegetation around those waterways that leads to these massive erosion events. So you can imagine if, that if there was a burrow in there, it would very quickly collapse. Um, of course, all that dirt and sediment then goes into the waterway and it smothers all that nice rocky substrate. And so you end up with this anoxic sludge that pretty much nothing lives in. Um, and then of course it opens it up to changes in um, water temperature because it's, there's no shade there. 
Um, there's very little flow, and so you get that stagnant water, you get algal blooms, and you know that's pretty poor quality there. And, and not surprisingly, we, we failed to capture any platypus. Um, and then we also do things like we allow stock access, which just exacerbates the problem. So, and a lot of what this thing, what this does, as well as like degrading their habitat, it fragments populations. And so that's that's a really critical thing in terms of um, wildlife populations. So. This is my poor animation of what wildlife populations tend to look like. So wildlife tend to live in things called metapopulations. So you get this clumped distribution. So if you imagine each of these circles are a, are a group of, it's a population of animals, um, and then they're connected by these corridors. And so when, say, young are born, they can disperse to the next population. They're all interconnected and there's movement going on between them. So if we have a catastrophe, if we have a fire event or a flood, and one of those populations disappear, it's able to be recolonized. When the habitat's good again, it can get recolonized and repopulated, and that population will return. That might be in a month, in a year, in 10 years' time, but it, it will return eventually. When we fragment these populations, we remove those connections, and we have a similar event, a catastrophe. It wipes out that population. There's no connection, so there's no ability for the neighboring populations to disperse and recolonize. And in a year's time or five years' time, we might have another event that happens and another. And so we lose these populations a, a piece at a time. And we might not necessarily notice it because it might just be a little waterway that disappears. Um, but it, we, we call it death by a thousand cuts. We get this gradual erosion of a much larger population into smaller, isolated populations that have much higher risk of extinction. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing, um, certainly in, in the Melbourne region. Other things that they face that um, we've introduced are things like predation. Um, not a huge issue for platypuses, but if we ruin their um, habitat and they have to leave the water and cross land to find better habitat, it certainly exposes them to foxes and dogs in particular. Cats, probably not much of an issue for these guys. We certainly find them getting entangled in litter or fishing equipment, um, something really simple like a hair tie. Um, I've seen mortality from hair ties and rubber bands, um, everyday items that we, we lose all the time and that goes into our waterways. And then these things, which are opera house nets, um, thankfully they are now illegal to use in Victoria. Um, but over the years, these have been responsible for hundreds and hundreds of platypus deaths across Australia. Um, another quick question break, Rich, and I'll, then I'll launch into what we sort of found from the, the Melbourne Water Program. So maybe just a couple of quick ones. Uh, yep. So I might work uh, backwards on some of these ones. So is it correct that one of the peptides in platypus venom has a D-amino acid in its structure? It's a bit more of a technical question. Oh, that is well beyond my skills. Um, I would say that there is a lot of uh, quite unique... Um, compounds in platypus venom that we still don't fully understand. Um, there's, I know there was one peptide they were looking at which seems to be an isomer and it, um, it flips at a certain time of the year and it tend, they think that it might be the thing that actually activates the venom. Um, and then there's a lot of unique compounds that they're looking at for, um, I think they were looking at venom for diabetes, either venom or milk for diabetes. Um, there's interest in developing new painkillers from their venom. Um, but yeah, I don't know a lot about the chemical composition, unfortunately. Um, if you don't get the band off its neck, will it die? Uh, yes, a lot of the time, unfortunately. So um, they're, they're very good at getting entangled in litter because they've got that streamlined shape. Um, the way they forage through the substrate, if there's anything that's an enclosed ring, it very easily goes over the head. Um, and then because they've got these little short stumpy legs, they can't get it off often. Sometimes it'll degrade and they'll be able to break it. But, um, you know, a lot of these things are very hardy, the, these plastic rings and stuff that are in the waterways. And um, eventually it just abrades and it cuts into the flesh underneath and it stops them being able to forage properly, um, creates opportunities for secondary infection. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of them do end up dying. I should say that that one that I showed before, we were able to get the ring off and release him, and he was pretty happy about it. Excellent. Uh, do yabby or crayfish farms have any impact on platypus populations? 
Um, I don't know a lot about the farms, but certainly the recreational fishing has done. Um, those kind of nets that I showed up before, basically anything that's an enclosed net, um, you know, that gets submerged in the water, um, you know, platypus eat yabbies. And so as soon as you get a yabby go into those nets, it then becomes a baited trap for platypus. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we've just seen, we've seen way too many of those deaths over the years. Um, since the... Uh, um, Platypus Alliance for Platypus Safe Nets, I think we were called. Um, we managed to lobby the government and get those things illegal in Victoria. And to my knowledge, since that ban came into effect 12 months ago, I don't think we've had any platypus drownings, which has been a, a great little um, success story and something that's going to, to help them cope with all the other threats that they face. That's fantastic to hear. Um, yeah, we've got a question well, around... Oh, sorry. That's right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just uh, we got a question about uh, their diet um, on particularly pollution tolerant macroinvertebrates. So, is have you seen any uh, impacts on platypus if they've got a reduced diet in terms of you know really low diversity and tolerant invertebrates compared to if they're feeding on a much more broader range and healthier diet of invertebrates? Does um, do you know if there's any impacts on lifespans or reproductive kind of system disruptions? No, I mean we don't we don't get a lot of info on lifespans, unfortunately. Um, certainly, condition-wise, look that the areas that I sort of consider quite degraded and I, and I would assume would have quite low invert diversity, I catch some whopper animals, um, and there seems to be this bit of a counterintuitive thing where you actually get larger platypus in poorer habitat, um, and and it's yeah, it sounds a bit weird, but. It, it, it seems to be their the, their way to cope with poorer conditions or less reliable conditions because if you've got a bigger body, you can store more fat. And so when food supply does decline temporarily, you're able to cope with those, um, those periods a lot better. So we certainly tend to find larger animals in poorer habitat, but less of them. Um, but yeah, so it's probably not more, not so much an individual impact, but more a population uh, impact where we just get lower abundance. Cool. Um, and we've got a question here that might be slightly related to that in terms of larger platies. Uh, is there data regarding the platypus populations in the upper and lower Maribyrnong catchment? Uh, well, I would say upper Maribyrnong, there's basically isn't a population anymore, unfortunately. Um, lower Maribyrnong is one of the areas where I've caught the largest platypus in the Mel in the Victoria, I think. It was about 2.7 kilos. Um, so unfortunately, that probably translates into it not being fantastic habitat. Um, but they're still in the lower... Uh, when I say lower Maribyrnong, I, I should say the... Um, the sort of Jackson's Creek, uh, Upper Maribyrnong River period uh, area. Um, and they still seem to be in reasonable abundance there, but they're not really found in many other places throughout the Maribyrnong catchment. Cool. Um, and I'll just check. We've got a few more that have come out. Um, have platypus recolonized the daylighted Upper Dandenong Creek area? Do you know of? No. Um, almost certainly not. Uh, I haven't been there recently to have a look. It's probably been a few years. Um, but the, the only place they exist in the Dandenong catchment is in the upper Mombolt Creek, and we are still trying to get them to just colonise the lower part of Mombolt Creek. Um, I think any recolonisation of Dandenong is going to take a very long time. Um, but, you know... All we can do is improve the habitat and hopefully it gets there eventually. And I think that was largely done, not specifically for platypus. It was done for a lot of other other things. But, um, yeah, look, I'd love to see them back there one day, but it's going to be a, a long time down the track. Cool. Uh, I might do another three questions and then get back to the presentation. Uh, yeah. what, is, what is a typical home range distance or length of river for a platypus? Uh, yep, good question. So these guys are really highly mobile and it makes that's one of the reasons why they're so difficult to study. Um, so a typical home range, so again, males are, are range a lot further than females, but typically sort of anything from one to about three kilometres. Cool. So yeah, really highly mobile and th they will cover several kilometres in a night. And during breeding season, we've done a few tracking studies, which I, I wasn't going to get into in this talk, but um, during breeding season where males are, are searching for females and also defending their territory, 
we recorded one adult male just patrolling up and down his territory. I think he covered about 15 Ks in a night. Um, have insect, yeah, sorry, have insecticides, pesticides, and fungicides washed into rivers have any impact on their DNA or their reproduction success? Um, yeah, the short answer is that we don't know. Probably nothing on their, their DNA. What it will do is it'll impact their food supply uh, again, and it's one of the reasons why there's fairly strict. There's, well, there should be very strict regulations as to what can and can't be used around waterways. Um, but yeah, I guess it sort of falls into that category of, um, you know, pollutants and water quality and affecting their food supply, which is then going to go up the chain and, and impact their, if they, I guess if they can't get enough food, they're not going to be in good enough condition to reproduce. Um, so yeah, it will, but it, it, it will do it indirectly. Cool. Uh, and finally, uh, we've got a question about what their main predators are. Maybe um, if you could touch on, you had a picture of a fox before. Are there other predators, both native and introduced, to yeah. platys? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they don't really have any native predators. Um, I'd imagine that up in maybe northern Queensland, the crocodile might take a few. But so they haven't really evolved with any predators. It's just ones that we've introduced. So particularly foxes and dogs um, are probably the big ones. They may, someone sent me a video a while ago of a Rakali um, going into a platypus burrow. So they might occasionally take like some eggs and young perhaps, but um, yeah, they really don't have any natural predators. Cool. All right. Well, um, we'll hit some of these other questions a bit later on. Okay, cool. All right. So I guess the main reason that we were here today was to really talk about the Melbourne Water Urban Platypus Program. So as I said, very unique program. And I guess at its heart, it's very broad objectives is to really understand what's going on with platypus populations around Melbourne. And because they are a difficult species to work with, it's, it's not a simple uh, question to answer. So I guess ultimately we're trying to work out, well, where are they now? Um, you know, what is their abundance in different areas? Is that increasing or decreasing? And from that, trying to understand, well, what are their threats and how can we manage our waterways to improve things for them? Um, and I guess a key component of the program is also about things like this. It's about public awareness, public education. Um, I do find, uh, you know, a lot of people around Melbourne are actually unaware that they've got platypuses in their local creek. And we are incredibly lucky that they are still quite widespread. So. That's ultimately what we're, we're trying to find out. And as I said, been running for about 25 years. Um, it certainly varies a lot over the years with different interests and different funding opportunities. Um, so yeah, it's not sort of one program, it's almost a, a combination of a lot of different things, but I'll, I'll just give you a very broad overview of it today. And I guess at the heart of the, the, the program is it has been live trapping surveys. So. These are the things that have been going on for years. And I mentioned that trapping surveys are incredibly labor intensive and time intensive. And just to give you an idea about what that means. So we use these specialized nets called fike nets. They get set in pairs and they're, they're inherently limited about where they can be set. So it needs to be quite small and shallow waterways so that one, that the animals are safe, they're not gonna drown, but also so that we can get in the water to be able to set the nets and, and, and get them um, you know, get the platypus out. Um, so that's one thing. We tend to set these, uh, so we set them in pairs like that. On a, on a survey night, we might set them in about five or six locations uh, along a waterway. So separated by sort of two, five, 10 kilometers. So quite a, a long area that might take all afternoon to do. We then have to check those nets all throughout the night. So every sort of three or four hours, we've got to get out there, go around to all these nets, check them for platypus, get rid of any bycatch, repair any holes that the Rakalis leave behind for them, and then we pack up at dawn. So it's a very time and labor intensive process, um, you know, limited by weather conditions and environmental conditions, but also opportunity to really generate some, some great data. Of course, the other thing is, is that it's also creates disturbance to the animals and so you know, we need to make sure that we're doing it in the right way and, and generating as, as good a data as we can. So this is, this is sort of the data that's been generated from that program. This is sort of roughly over the last 10 years. So uh, for those unfamiliar, these are the, the river catchments of Melbourne. So the CBD is in the middle here. 
Um, these are the, the five major river catchments. Each of these dots represents somewhere where nets have been set overnight. Uh, orange is where we've recorded platypuses and grey is where we haven't. Now, over these 10 years, some of these sites might have only been surveyed once. Some have been surveyed every year for 10 years. So it's quite variable, but it just gives you a very broad overview as to what that looks like. And you can probably already start to see some patterns there where we get a lot of orange dots out here, not so many in these more sort of agricultural areas. Um, and as far as I know, we've never had any records down on Mornington Peninsula, despite some persistent rumours. So each of these little clusters represents a, a survey night. Um, and to give you an idea about the data that we sort of generate from this, it, so as I mentioned before, measuring abundance for platypus is incredibly difficult. So we use um, relative ind indexes, something like uh, captures per unit effort. So basically it's the number of platypuses we capture standardised by the number of nets that we put out there. And so the theory is if you put out more nets, you should capture more. Um, and conversely, if there's more platypuses around, you should capture more. And so really the idea is about understanding the trends over time rather than trying to actually say, are there 20 platypuses here or 50 platypuses here? Because we just simply can't do that. And so this is one of our trapping sites up in the um, upper Maribyrnong catchment. Um, as you can see, pretty significant decline over time. Until recently, we weren't catching anything. And they're now, if they're not extinct, then they're pretty much functionally extinct there. Um, oh, so I should just maybe explain these graphs. So on the uh, x-axis here, we have our measure of abundance, our captures per unit effort. And then we have our time frame at the bottom. And I've tried to keep it standard for the different graphs so you're able to compare between them. So this is an area where they've, they've basically uh, disappeared during that time period. We do have a few areas where they've been relatively steady over the entire time period. Unfortunately, not many. Um, the other thing that's probably interesting to note here is the massive variation you get between surveys, which is one of the challenges with, with platypuses. But generally what we've seen at most of the areas that we're surveying has been a, a trend like this. So um, significant declines over time. Since the drought finished in about 2010, we've certainly have seen an increase in abundance. But as I mentioned earlier, the, their recovery takes a long time because they're such slow reproducing. And in some areas, we're, we're really not seeing any response at all. So um, this tends to be the pattern that we're seeing uh, across Melbourne um, most of the time. We've, we've had a few areas where they've disappeared completely. We have a, a couple of areas in good quality habitat where they're relatively stable, but probably the vast majority of them, we're seeing significant declines. And I guess the other thing we can get from this, so our measure of abundance is, is one thing, but because we, with trapping, the, the massive advantage of trapping animals is you're able to identify individuals, which means you can, you can record their sex, their age, their weight, all these kind of things. Um, so you get an idea about demographics. You can get uh, a measure of juvenile recruitment. So over our, um, particularly in autumn, when we see juveniles coming out of burrows, we can look at how many juveniles we capture. Um, again, really variable here, but I guess the, the kind of patterns that we see is that we see more juveniles when we have good autumn rainfall. And conversely, as was mentioned before, when we get flooding over summer, when juveniles are in their burrow, we see very few juveniles the next year. The other thing that's kind of noticeable here is during this drought period through the early 2000s, overall, we've got sort of lower juvenile compared to these last few years. So again, we had um, you know, the drought had an impact. Since that drought's finished, we are seeing more juveniles. We are seeing more um, animals around the place. So, again, it sort of corresponds with what we see with our abundance data as well. The other things that we can get from this is we can take genetic samples to look at population health. Um, we get information on longevity. And a couple of years ago, we recorded the oldest known wild male platypus. So it extended the, the known longevity of platypuses in the wild by almost 10 years. So simple things like that that we just don't understand about this species. Um, we get an idea about movements and dispersal sometimes. Um, and just a couple of years ago, we recorded a, a sub-adult male that moved 55 kilometres over about 12 months. So the longest dispersal that's ever been recorded in, in platypuses. And then, of course, we get some individual things like we can record their weights and condition um, their general health, 
We record the litter entanglement and, and, and rescue them when possible. So there's our, our mate from Werribee that we, re, that we released earlier. Um, one of the things I guess I particularly enjoy about it is the, is the ability to engage the public. So we often take undergraduate students out with us on, on surveys to give them field experience. But being able to show locals and particularly kids that these little critters are in their, in their backyard is, uh, is amazing. Being able to show someone a platypus for the first time is something that I, I really enjoy. Um, and then, of course, we quickly get them back into the water as, as quickly as possible. So I guess as well as the, the trapping program, one of the, the strengths of this program is that over the years we've been able to develop new ways of monitoring platypuses. And the advent of technology is usually bad for wildlife, but smartphones have actually been a, a massive bonus in terms of um, being able to expand citizen science. And so... You know, we have a, a website and mobile phone app where people are able to record their sightings. That all goes into a public database so you can see where platypus have been found. You can look in your local area. All that data is there and available for anyone to use. And it's, it was just recently used for someone's PhD thesis. Um, it was used in a paper that was recently published and it's about to be used in a um, application for, for having this species listed as, as threatened. So if you are lucky enough to see a platypus, please record it. Um, that data is incredibly useful because we just have such little information on this species. The other thing we've done uh, relatively recently in the last probably four or five years is develop something called environmental DNA. And this has been an absolute game changer for myself as a platypus ecologist. Um, for those that don't know what uh, environmental DNA is, basically we're all shedding genetic material into the environment. Platypus are doing the same thing. They're shedding skin cells, hair cells, anything that lives in a waterway has, has urine and, and feces that goes into that waterway. That all has genetic material in it. And now our um, laboratory techniques are sensitive enough and cost effective enough in that we can go and take a sample of that water and look for that genetic material and identify what species are present. So incredibly um, useful technique. Some of the big advantages of it is that it's, it's non-invasive. We don't have to capture the animal to know that it's present. Um, we don't have to disturb them by trapping them. The sampling methodology is incredibly simple so that you know, field ecologists like myself can do it. Um, but it's also a really great opportunity to engage with citizen scientists. And we've run a number of programs with community groups, land care groups, school children, getting them out there, taking these water samples, recording habitat details, getting them involved in really rigorous science and data, collecting data that's going to help the conservation of this species. Um, and I guess ultimately one of the biggest advantages is that it's, it's incredibly sensitive and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute and it's also very cost effective for us to be able to generate this data over a very large scale. There's one of my colleagues just demonstrating the, the sampling technique so you know very simple sampling methodology. So when we were developing this technique because we've got such great data from the Melbourne region we're able to verify it against the trapping data and so we worked with some um, very clever modelers at, at the university and looked at what's the sensitivity of our trapping technique. So any monitoring technique, you want to have a good probability of detecting the species that you're after. And so with our trapping, um, if we want to achieve that magical sort of 95% um, detection rate, we've got to do between six and 10 trapping events. So these are all night trapping um, sagas, I guess, that we've got to do to give us a 95% confidence that we can detect a platypus at that site. Now, with our eDNA, we can take two water samples, run a couple of replicates in the lab, and we get about a 97 or 98% detection rate. So if they're there, we are going to pick them up with a couple of water samples. So we can have incredibly high reliability that the results we're getting are, are very accurate. And just to illustrate what we're able to do with that. So again, we're back in the Melbourne water region. Um, you can see the, the CBD in the middle here. And this is what a typical 12 month trapping program looks like for me. So again, these dots represent net sites. Orange are where we captured platypuses. Um, so some of these areas where we know platypus are there, but in very low abundance, we simply don't pick them up or we, we very rarely pick them up. And, and that's very typical for platypus. 
Um, so from, from 12 months, this was about 100 sites that I looked at in about 20 different waterways. So for comparison with eDNA, in about three or four months, we were able to generate data like this. So we looked at 350 sites, 125 different waterways, um, areas where we can't actually put nets in, like the Yarra River, which is simply just too big and deep for us to set our nets. Um, these areas here, like Werribee, where we failed to capture an animal that year, we pick them up with eDNA because it's so sensitive. And so it gives us great capacity to then look at how these things change over time. So essentially, we've just mapped the entire distribution of platypuses in a couple of months. And you can kind of see the power of that to be able to go, well, if we do that every year or every five years and see how those things change, you can very easily pick up declines um, in different areas. And you can overlay other data sets, things like um, water quality data, urbanisation, vegetation, whatever you want, really. And because you've got such a high number of sites, you suddenly have high power to be able to do those statistical analyses. And I think you can probably already start see the, some pretty clear patterns where, you know, in these western regions that are pretty dry and agricultural, we get very few records of platypuses, whereas this upper Yarra and, and Bunyip region, which is relatively undisturbed, highly, um, you know, still intact forest in those areas, we get much higher um, detection rates up there. And so we can actually look at that. Um, we can quantify that... Um, I guess, site occupancy of platypuses. This is what we get. So this is the percentage of sites where we're able to detect platypuses in each of those different cats. And so in, where's my cursor gone? In Werribee and Dandenong, we get very low detection rates and that mirrors exactly what we see with our trapping data. And similarly in the, in the Yarra and Western Port, we get our highest catch rates. We also get our highest um, site occupancy of platypuses. So it's a slightly different way of looking at population. So instead of looking at abundance, you're looking at something like site occupancy. But I guess it's a measure of population health across the catchment rather than at a, at a local scale. And again, it's providing us a, another line of evidence to say what's going on with platypus population. And so we have our, our CPUE data, we have our demographic data, we have our genetic data, and now our eDNA data, and they're all telling us the same thing. So multiple lines of evidence that are all pointing in the right direction is really critical for waterway managers to have good, good information um, to direct their conservation efforts and understand if those efforts are working. Um, oops, forgot about that one. So, and I guess ultimately, what are we doing with this data? So it's all good to be able to collect this information, understand where platypuses are, understand what's going on with our populations increasing and decreasing. But ultimately what we're trying to do is understand what is behind those changes and how can we uh, manage waterways in a better way to be able to improve populations. So habitat quality is a, is a key factor behind um, the health of, of, of any wildlife population, but it's also a very sort of difficult, um, it's a difficult thing to measure because habitat quality incorporates a number of different uh, factors and it's gonna differ between different species. And so for platypus, it might incorporate your riparian vegetation, your water quality, your flow regime, your in-stream complexity, the presence of burrowing habitat. So there's a lot of different factors that go into it. So we worked with uh, a guy called Tom Grant, who is, um, who, who I think almost universally would be considered the uh, the godfather of platypus research. Um, he's been studying these little critters for, I think, over 40 years now. Um, so we worked with him to come up with a, an index of habitat quality that incorporates all these different factors that are known to be beneficial for platypuses. And we went out to all the sites where we had all this trapping data. So again, utilizing all this great data that we've been collecting over the years, to see whether that index actually corresponded with our platypus data. And not surprisingly, we found areas that have higher habitat quality also have higher abundance of platypuses. And I should point out, again, a lot of variability here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we do get that relationship of better habitat quality equals more platypuses. Now, this is very intuitive and probably not surprising, but being able to generate the actual data to demonstrate that is a whole nother matter. And for platypus, it's a very difficult thing to do. 
And similarly, when we look at juvenile recruitment, we get a, we get a similar relationship. So better habitat quality, we're getting more juveniles um, into the system and surviving more. So again, what we might expect, but um, you know, good to be able to have rigorous data that sits behind it. And I should say that this also, um, we get a very similar pattern with our eDNA data. So where we get better quality habitat, we get higher site occupancy. So again, it's about having multiple lines of evidence. The other thing, now I talked about flow regime probably being the biggest impact um, on platypuses. Now that it's not really captured in our habitat index. So just to drop back, that the index that we developed was something that we could very easily just go out to a waterway and do visually, very, very simply and easily and quickly. Um, we've now adapted it to have our citizen scientists doing it as well. So, but obviously you can't measure flow regimes just by going out to a waterway. That's a lot more detailed and in depth. Um, you also miss things like water quality, which is what's going to account for some of this variation. But so um, last year we delved a bit deeper into flow regimes. Um, and again, because we've got a massive data set over a long period, over a lot of different waterways, we were able to look at the impacts of, of different flow regimes on platypus populations. And there's probably two major issues that we have with waterways um, across Australia, I guess. One is that we are reducing the amount of water that uh, is going into our waterways. So talked a little bit about this earlier. Climate change is reducing rainfall in this area. We are damming and, re and putting reservoirs into areas. We're putting farm dams into our landscape we're taking water out of these systems. So essentially we are just reducing the amount of water that's available for our aquatic species. And this was one of our study sites. This is actually um, in the upper deep creek. And so what's this, what this graph showing is, so yeah, the number of cease to flow events, so the number of times that this um, creek is stopping flowing each year is getting much more common. So this is a 30 year time period. Not surprisingly, you saw a lot of it during the drought but since the drought is finished, we're still seeing high numbers of cease to flow events. And similarly at the bottom, the length, the duration of those cease to flow events is also increasing. So it's probably not hard to imagine is that when rivers stop flowing and they stop flowing for a longer period of time, that's not good for things that live in them. The other issue we've got, and this is quite unique to urban environments, is that because we have basically concreted our surrounding catchments, we we changed our flow regime. So when we get rainfall now, instead of it seeping into the soil and into the, the vegetated areas and slowly um, seeping into the waterways over a period of time, it's rushing into our stormwater drains and rushing into our waterways. And so we get these huge changes in water flow and water level immediately after rainfall events. And then almost as quickly, it goes back down to these very low levels. And so this is very well recognised. It's called the urban stream syndrome. There's a lot of um, issues that are associated with it. But this is another thing that we see um, in, in urban waterways. And not surprisingly, both of these have pretty significant factor, uh, impacts on platypus populations. So um, when we modelled that relationship, basically the, the the more and longer our cease to flow events, the, the less capacity there was to support platypuses. And similarly with our high variability, the higher the variability, the, the, less, the less likely you were to have platypuses in those areas. And I guess these graphs are looking a little bit boring, but what the, what's really useful about them is that from a management perspective, you're able to go to your waterway and look at what the current flow regimes are, work out how you're able to change them. And if you were to sort of slide up along this scale, you can see if you're able to reduce your cease to flow events by 10 days or 20 days, what's your expected response from platypus population? So if you, yeah, it gives you a, a, an ability to quantify what you might expect from your management. So I just want to finish with a very broad overview of, of sort of what we've found from this Melbourne Water Program. So again, we're back in our, the five catchments here. So I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to compile historical data on platypuses and, and these blue lines here represent waterways where I'm pretty confident platypuses used to exist in the past. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we used to get them right down the Yarra into the CBD. We used to get them all through our major waterways. Um, basically every waterway that was permanent and flowing, um, we think had platypuses a while ago. 
this is our current situation. So we still have them fairly widespread, but we're seeing a contraction of distribution. So they've disappeared from the, the central CBD. Um, they're disappearing from a lot of these smaller waterways in the drier areas because they, they just stopped flowing. And then we get this issue of fragmentation. So here in the Werribee River, there's a big absence in the middle here because there's a, there's a giant dam in the way. Um, here in the Maribyrnong, there's another big absence because it's just really poor habitat quality. Again, here in the, the Plenty River, in Lilydale here, there's another, there's a lake and dam that's in the way that's basically disconnected it from the Yarra system. And so we're getting not just a contraction of population, we're also getting this fragmentation problem that I talked about earlier. And not surprisingly, if we then look at not just our distribution data, but we add in our abundance, we add in our juvenile recruitment, our genetic health, and we rate these populations um, just on a very simple scale from you know, healthy, moderate and poor, at, we'll give it, I'll give, give it a traffic, traffic light system. So green is where we have healthy populations, red is where we have poor, and orange are ones that are okay, but they have a few issues. Not surprisingly, all these little isolated populations don't have great viability. They've got pretty poor outlooks. Um, and that's the issue that we have with fragmentation. Whereas when we have large interconnected systems like we do in that upper Yarra, we have a very healthy, resilient population that's able to cope with fluctuations in the environment over time. So unfortunately, that's the situation we're facing at the moment. And, you know, the, the challenge that we have is being able to improve conditions in these small isolated populations to ensure that they persist into the future. And that's exactly what, um, you know, this program has been informing management strategies for Melbourne Water. And so I guess some of the things that get implemented are identifying litter hotspots where we get, you know, high rates of entanglement of platypus. And so you can implement um, you know, litter traps, uh, litter reduction strategies, community education. Um, in the Belgrave region, they've recently uh, implemented some silt traps to reduce sedimentation into waterways uh, to improve conditions. Things like removing willows from particularly agricultural regions has been really important. And I guess following on from that is the revegetation process, so fencing stock out of waterways, working with landowners to revegetate those areas, improve conditions, um, stabilising banks to reduce erosion events like you see here that gets scattered around the place where we can identify. So when we talked about habitat quality before, you can break it down into your individual components and go, okay, we have a heap of bank erosion in this area. That's one of the key factors that we need to tackle. Um, in other areas, there's been artificial riffles installed to create habitat complexity. Environmental flows are getting a massive um, focus now, and things like the, the Tarrigo and Werribee River have environmental flows um, implemented in them. So all of this stuff helps to improve conditions for platypus, and hopefully we're going to be seeing um, responses in, in the near future. So I think that's it from me. Um, I'll leave you with my favourite meme for platypuses. And um, I should say, if you do want to keep up to date with what we do with our platypus research, you can um, follow us on social media un under Platypus Spot, um, both Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, I, I'm not as active as I should be, but I'll try to be better. And you can see what we get up to in the field and some of the results that we get. And um, yeah, I'll tackle those last few questions, I think, Rich. Excellent. A uh, few might be understanding it a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> heap, of, heap of engagement in this uh, presentation. Right. <laughs> um, so there's a really good question here about what are some of the ways to reduce habitat fragmentation? Is it possible to create human constructed green corridors for platypus? So that might be expanding a little bit on what you were mentioning just then. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is, and I, I guess the, the first thing is understanding what that fragmentation is because there's a lot of things that are going to um, cause fragmentation and it might be, you know, physical barriers are quite easy uh well they're, they're easy to identify less easy to circumvent but you know things like fish, fish ladders get implemented um, around reservoirs to enable um, passage so if it's poor habitat it might be improving riparian zones it might be um installing those artificial riffles to improve um in-stream habitat complexity sometimes it might be really poor flow regimes and that's where uh environmental flows are, are critical to improve that connectivity so I guess there's a lot of different things that can cause fragmentation. Um, it's about identifying 
what it is and how we can address it. There was a question on the habitat quality index that you were using for some of your work. Is there a paper or a similar resources available for people to find out more about that? Uh, there is. So, um, yep. So Tom Grant has actually published that index with some of that data um, a couple of years ago. We use a, a slightly modified version of that index, which um, is very, very similar to, there's a program called River Detectives that's been implemented by CMAs around Victoria. And we find that's really good. It, it's, a, it's a simplified version that's really good for citizen scientists to um, uh, utilise but it incorporates a lot of the same things that we had in our index as well. And we've done it with a few um, community groups and again, sort of correlated between um, our eDNA data and their habitat quality results. And it, it's quite coarse, but again, you get more platypus in areas where there's higher quality. So um, yeah, there's a few different resources there. A few people have been asking about uh, ways that they can contribute to some of the community group work uh, to help platypus, so whether that's collecting eDNA or other monitoring programs. Um, yep. Some people have been asking specifically about like areas in northern New South Wales. Uh, so if anyone that's in the Melbourne region, we have the platypus census program, so you can get in touch with us through uh, Water Watch uh, if you wanted to get involved in the Melbourne water area. So Melbourne and uh, sorry, Port Phillip and Western Port catchments. Do you know of other organisations that are running a similar kind of monitoring and platypus action activities? Yes, yes. And sorry, I forgot to highlight our um, the citizen science work in in that Melbourne Water region. So that big map that I put up of um, platypus eDNA data, we had a number of citizen scientist groups involved in that. And I was was on my notes to mention, I forgot, so I do apologise. Um, so generally, a, a lot of the people that we work with, I guess, outside of Melbourne tend to be land care groups. So certainly becoming a member of your local land care group or just staying abreast of what's going on. Um, you know, we've got one coming up in the Moorabool region, um, hopefully when we're actually able to go out and do things in Victoria. Um, there's been a few different groups up in New South Wales that are starting to jump on board. Um, and we have a, an upcoming project uh, with East Gippsland Landcare Network um, that's underway at the moment. So, yeah, so generally it's, it's I guess the, the way that it tends to work is that there'll be landcare groups that are kind of interested in understanding about platypus in their area. They will apply for grants um, in conjunction with us. And then if we're successful, we're able to, to then sort of roll those programs out. Uh, I think we've also got some of our colleagues from the um, Upper Murrumbidgee system in ACT. So if anyone's in that region, you can also check in with them about some of their platypus activities. Um, how accurate is the data that's been collected through the eDNA process? Um, could you be marking the same individual um, if it's moving through, say, like a three-kilometre patch? Or are you um, yeah, analysing species genetic material, not individual uh, individual platypus genetic material. Yeah, so I should say with uh, with eDNA, because you're dealing with quite degraded and fragmented um, DNA, you, you're not identifying individuals, you're just identifying the species. And so that, um, that comment about identifying, um, you know, potentially picking up the same species is a good one. And that's, you need to design a sampling program so that you've got independence in your sites. And so generally, if I'm looking at platypus distribution, I won't be sampling water um, in air, in, at sites any more than sort of any closer than about five kilometres and often a lot more than that. So you're, you're certainly going to be picking up um, different animals um, that way. But yeah, there has been, a, I should say, there has been a few papers published uh, for different species where they're starting to be able to identify individuals um, I don't fully understand how they do it, but it's certainly something I'm keen to explore a bit further. So stay tuned. Cool. Always a, an evolving field in this uh, this new space. Um, can you talk about survey results from the Belgrave Lake Park? Are you have you had involvement with that? I have. Yep. Um, yeah. So I guess that upper Mumbolt Creek is the last little. Um, bastion for, for platypuses in that whole Dandenong region. Um, so they've sort of been, over, over the, the course of the Melbourne Water Program, they've been contracting up Mombolt Creek. Um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment by Melbourne Water to improve habitat quality. So there's been a, a massive willow removal and revegetation program 
downstream of Bird's Land. Um, there's those silt traps that are going in. There's some artificial riffles that are going in um, and some bank stabilisation works to try to get that population to expand. Um, but, yeah, so we, we, we do tend to pick them up in the Belgrave Lake area. So basically, uh, I guess the, the national park just upstream of Belgrave Lake down to Birdsland is what their current distribution is, but we're trying to get them to expand a bit further. But, um, yeah, few and far between, unfortunately. Excellent. We also had a question about that Birdsland project, so I think that's covered that as well, which is handy. Yeah, it's super exciting, and I guess the, the, the thing that I'm interested in, so... No one has ever really gone out and specifically tried to target habitat improvements for platypus and then monitor if it's having an effect. And, and we're actually doing that at the moment. So the, the, the impact on platypus is going to take some time, but we're going to look at their distribution and, and hopefully see them start turning up in that lower part of the creek, which is the idea. But we're also looking at the macroinvertebrates, which is a lot of what we're trying to do with improving habitat quality is basically improving habitat for macroinvertebrates. Excellent. Uh, another question about the eDNA sampling. Uh, how long uh, do those um, genetic materials stay in the water? So can you affirm that it's been, you know, if it's 48 hours or longer, is it still yep. viable for collecting? Yeah, yeah, good good answer, uh, good question and not a simple answer. So generally in um, open water, and free water, it lasts um, anything from sort of one to about seven or eight days. So it is real time. You're not picking up, um, you know, platypus that were there last year, you're picking up animals that are living there at that particular time. So, and the length of time that it persists is, is varies a lot depending on the conditions in the water, um, temperature, UV, all these kind of things that degrade DNA over time. So it's not a, I guess it's not a simple answer, but generally it's, it's lasting for a, for a few days. Excellent. Uh, there's a question about the Platypus Spot app and the website. Is that only for Victoria or is that a more broader program? Uh, no, no. We are now, I think we're up to about 1,200 sightings all across their range. So from every state and territory that they exist in. So wherever you see one, you can you can stick it on there. Um, I, I would ask you not to put Hillsville Sanctuary down, which a few people have done. <laughs> Um, but no, it is Australia wide and um, it's, it's been very much focused on Victoria because that's where we tend to be able to promote it much more. But no, it's essentially Australia wide. Uh, how do you age a platypus? <laughs> uh, with great difficulty, unfortunately. So this is one of the challenges about working with them is that once. So for young males, you can you can um, age them in their first probably 18 months by the, the size and morphology of their spur. After about 18 months or two years, they then become adult. And so from two years to, you know, the oldest one we just caught at 21, we, we can't age them. So the only way that we're able to age them is if we've captured them previously and they've got a microchip, uh, which all of the animals we catch do. And I guess that's that's one of the big benefits of having a long-term um, monitoring program is that you, you're able to recapture animals over time and understand a bit about longevity, which is very difficult to do with platypuses because you don't often recapture them. But, um, yeah, so basically that's the only way that, that we're able to do it. Cool. Uh, should platypuses have been classified as endangered rather than near threatened with the latest change in classification? Uh, well... I think we now have enough data to pretty confidently say yes. Um, I would say almost certainly in Victoria, and um, there has been an application put in to list them in Victoria, which um, has been tabled for about two years and um, unfortunately is taking some time to get through. But I would say certainly in Victoria they should be... Um, whether they should be classified across Australia, I... I don't know. I, we don't have enough data from other states, but I would almost certainly say yes. Cool. Uh, there's a question on the turbidity levels that they can tolerate over extended periods. Is there any kind of information in terms of their, their tolerance to, to that? Um, not for them directly. I, I think turbidity is probably one of the key degrading factors in waterways. Um, and, and again, it affects their food supply. So 
all that sediment smothers that all those nooks and crannies that the bugs live in, um, you know, clogs up their what are macroinvertebrate? They're not gills. What are they? Spiracles. Clogs up their spiracles. So it just it basically just kills and wipes out all the bugs. Um, it lowers the overall primary productivity, so you don't get that sort of uh, biofilm growing. Um, and so you know that again, it goes up the food chain, and eventually platypus just have nothing to eat and move on. Um, so yes, I think it's a massive issue, but um, no one has linked it directly to platypus yet. Has there been any tagging of animals to track the movements of platys? Uh, yes. So a um, couple of things. So, I mean, all, all of our animals get a microchip. So when we catch them again, we can record who they are. So we get a little bit of information about movements from that, but that means we've got to capture them again. Tracking platypuses is really difficult. Um, so historically, there was some stuff done with radio tracking, but they're quite large tags and... Um, as soon as you put anything on an animal, you've got to justify the weight and drag and, and risk to the animal. So we've done some work as part of the Melbourne Water Program. Um, we use something called acoustic telemetry, which is typically used for fish. So the tags that you use are about the size of a Panadol capsule, so there's no impact on the animal. We simply just glued them onto their back and then uh, looked at movements. Um, so they get picked up with underwater receivers. Um, so, yeah, we looked at a couple of things there. Um, one, looking at them in response to the, that urban stream syndrome that I mentioned, and then also in response to environmental flows just to, to kind of see how they're doing. But it's, it's very short term. Long term tracking is, is, a, is a whole nother thing. Um, I'd love to be able to get some GPS tags on them and track them long term, but um, you can't put collars or harnesses or anything on them. Um, so, yeah, and, and you just simply won't get those tags back again. So there has been a little bit of work done, but um, not a great deal because it's just so challenging for, for the animal. Uh, one of the early questions was around, what is the prehistoric species of platypus? Ah, yeah, not something I, I know a great deal about. Um, I know that there used to be a platypus that had teeth and was up to about a metre or a metre and a half long. Um, there has been a platypus ancestor discovered over in South America as well. So when Australia and South America were connected as, as part of Gondwana. Um, but yeah, not, not something I know a lot of. I know that they do go back millions of years. Um, the current, the current um, I guess, form of platypus is, um, I think, over 100,000 years old or, or 70,000 years old. So they haven't changed a great deal in a, in a very long time, but um, yeah, I don't have a, a great deal of info on um, their their evolutionary history. Cool. Uh, we got a question from the Upper Murrumbidgee area. So they've had water levels that have been consistently very low for a number of years, and it's likely that the entrances of burrows would have ended up about 50 centimetres higher than the water levels. Uh, do platypuses, are they likely to use the exposed burrows that are higher up or would they make new ones lower down? Um, both. So I'll, I'll often find, um, so yeah, the, the entrances are often under the water, but because water levels do fluctuate so much, they, they do end up up above. Um, it's not a major issue. Um, if, if it gets too high above the water level, if it ends up being sort of several metres away, then you know, that time that they spend on land, it then becomes very easy for, say, a fox to just grab them before they get in the water. Once they're in the water, they're pretty secure. But, yeah, any time that they've got to spend on the land, um, they become really vulnerable. They're a bit clumsy and, and unco on the land as well. Um, so it, it's not ideal, but they are adaptable. I guess where it becomes more of a challenge is if it's a maternal burrow. So if there's young in that burrow, they basically can't leave mum has to come and go into that same burrow and expose herself often all the time whereas you know if it's just a regular burrow they can easily move to another one uh, if need be or just use it occasionally so yeah it's, it's not ideal um i think that probably the bigger issue about the upper murrumbidgee is just the the idea of cease to flow impacts and and lack of habitat and lack of food supply is probably the, the bigger issue great 
Uh, there were a few questions about where to see platypus in the wild, particularly around Victoria. Do you have any kind of top tips for seeing platys? Uh, yep, number one, Lake Elizabeth out in the Otways. Well, hang on, I should say no one can go anywhere at the moment, but when we are able to go out again, <laughs> um, Lake Elizabeth would be my absolute almost guaranteed spot. Um, but in Quite Melbourne, handy next to the camping spot there as well in Forest. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot just to go have a look at anyway. But yeah, I think... Uh, I think I've been there once where I've never seen one. And even at like, you know, middle of the day, I'll tend to see one or two swimming around the place. So that's almost, it's almost guaranteed. Um, but then just in, in Melbourne, like just out of the CBD, like go to Finns Reserve in Templestowe and that's pretty reliable. Um, Upper Yarra around Warburton is, is pretty reliable as well. So that, that'd be my suggestions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's a mention here, if, if you're in the Bacchus Marsh or Murrabal area, you can get in touch with the Bacchus, uh, Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance. They're doing some really good work out there. So if you're out in the West, that might be a chance to see some of the platies out the Werribee River. Um, yeah, and actually that, that, that's an area where they seem to have recolonized over the last probably half a dozen years. Um, they We didn't actually have any in Bacchus Marsh for a very long time and, and probably... There's been a number of sightings, and even we've started picking them up with eDNA um, over the last few years. Um, yeah, so they seem to have been coming out of that Werribee Gorge into the Bacchus Marsh region uh, a bit more recently. Oh, that's exciting. So coming over the, some of those smaller barriers. Yeah, so we, we always knew that there was a little remnant population in Werribee Gorge. Um, but, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, the flow regime in Bacchus Marsh used to be pretty poor. Um, and especially when I was monitoring it, it was kind of at the end of the drought. So it was often, you know, just a trickle going through. Seems to have been improved now. I think there's been a lot of work done with some revegetation work as well. So I guess it's one of those um, success stories that, you you know, you're seeing that population expand a little bit in response to, to better conditions. Cool. Uh, what is the strategy to increase numbers of platypus and where is funding coming from? Probably the million dollar question. Yeah, well, I mean, largely, so unfortunately, because it's not a listed species, it doesn't particularly get funding. And so, you know, in the Melbourne region, we're incredibly lucky that, you know, Melbourne Water has a, as part of their charter to monitor and look after platypuses. And so that's where a lot of that funding comes from. Um, and often it'll be either direct work from Melbourne Water or it will be, um, you know, funding to community groups to do some work. Um Outside of the Melbourne, it's typically uh, the responsibility of the CMAs, I guess, and, and a little bit of the councils. Um, but often it's, I guess, it's sort of general habitat improvement stuff rather than specifically targeting platypus. Um, and I should say that I guess that the general stuff that we do to improve habitat is, is just improving general river health. I mean, they are such uh, adaptable creatures that everything you do that's going to improve conditions in a waterway is going to be beneficial for, for platypuses and, and vice versa. Anything you do to help platypuses helps everything else in that waterway. And I'll add uh, in the Melbourne region, if you check out the Healthy Waterway Strategy, there's a number of sites that are prioritised for platypus as uh, one of the key values and uh, works will be directed to, to try and improve conditions for them. Um so here's a question: If there's, if you know of any platypus that are in Hoddles Creek or the Little Yarra River, in those kind of areas? Uh, yep, absolutely. Uh, yep, Yarra, Little Yarra is one of our, well, was one of our long-term monitoring sites. So, um, yeah, again, we saw sort of numbers declining over the drought, but when we were, uh, we haven't been there for a couple of years now, but we had some pretty reasonable results last time we were there. Um, so, yeah, they're certainly in Little Yarra. Uh, Hoddles Creek, I've never done any trapping in, but we have done a couple of rounds of, of eDNA and and picked them up in, in Hoddles Creek, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, platypus solitary or do they live in colonies? Ah, yeah, um, very solitary. And so that's one of the things that makes them challenging to work with is that they, they're quite um, sparsely distributed animals. They don't sort of hang out in these big groups. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very solitary. Basically, they um, in breeding season, males and females get together and mate and then go their own way. Um, females obviously have to suckle and raise their young for a couple of months, but it seems to be pretty much as soon as they leave the burrow, um, the young are off on their own. They might hang around for a, for a couple of weeks with mum, but they're, they're very quickly, um, I guess, kicked out of home and told to go 
find their own way in the world. And, and it's also like, linked to like this the season that we're trying to get eDNA and uh, monitoring happening as well when the juveniles have been kicked out. Yeah, well, it's, it's, pro and it's probably something I didn't um, mention with the, the trapping program is that so typically we would do surveys in spring to target the breeding season, which is when they're most active and you get, um, you know, the, the highest the highest capture rate. And then also in autumn to capture juveniles as they're kind of dispersing from the burrows and get that understanding about whether they're breeding or not. So, and it's kind of similar with, with eDNA. I mean, you're not identifying individuals, but you're trying to target times of the year where you've got the best chance of detecting animals that are there. Excellent. Um, another question that's linked to that is, do they only use their own burrows or do they use ones that are being made by other platypus? Um, good question. And I don't think we've got a great deal of information on it. I, I think there was some very early tracking data that I'm sure I've read something about burrow sharing, um, but I think it, it's quite, um, it's not a common thing. Um, but I, I guess it's one of those one of those things that we just don't really have much information of. Um, so yeah, I, it, it does happen. I just don't know how common it is. Um, are you linked with the platypus.asn.au um, group where sightings of platypus and Bacali can be logged? Uh, no, we're not. Um, so I, yeah, the, the, not sure where those sightings go, unfortunately. Um, so I guess one of the reasons why we developed Platypus Spot was so that all those sightings were available to anyone that wanted to use them and the public can see them. So, um, no, I mean, we have a little bit of um, contact with the Platypus Conservancy, but don't sort of work with them a great deal. Cool. Uh, we've got a uh, question about pollution from industrial estates. Uh, seems to be a huge issue for the water quality in rivers and creeks around Melbourne. Is there much happening in this space in terms of sampling enforcement, engagement, and education? Um, not, I guess there's nothing directly in terms of monitoring platypuses around those areas. Um, I mean, I think a lot of that probably gets um, overseen by someone like the, the EPA and there will be regulations about what they can and can't do. Um, but yeah, I've certainly seen waterways where there's a lot of, particularly things like sedimentation that happens off of construction sites. Um, and I, I don't really know how they're policed and regulated, unfortunately, but it's, it's certainly an issue. And with the amount of construction that we have around Melbourne, um, particularly on the urban fringes, it's, um, it, it's certainly an issue. And yeah, I'd like to, <laughs> I'll, I'll be diplomatic. I would certainly like to see more done in that space. Um, and we also have, with the Water Watch um, team, we have a water quality monitoring program where we do track some sites in terms of, like, uh, pollutants and water quality conditions, uh, and particularly, like, the, the Weary River area in Bacchus Marsh, we have been looking at turbidity um, levels that have been coming down um, in that area and how that might be potentially an impact on the platypus population out there. So um, there are some monitoring projects, uh, some citizen science projects, and there's also, yeah, there's the opportunity to get in touch with EPA if you are seeing, um, you know, areas of concern, if you're seeing uh, potential pollution uh, impacts that are happening, definitely the EPA is a really good spot to, to get in touch with, or you can get in touch with Melbourne Water's uh, inquiry line as well. Um, so there's a couple of options you have in that space. Good one. Um, Thanks, Rich. And one last one. We've got someone that's mentioned that they've seen a platypus in the Werribee River at Bacchus Marsh in last October. So if you're not involved in that uh, platypus alliance out there, uh, I highly recommend getting in touch with them. And also, if you haven't, um, get that up on the Platypus Spot uh, app or the website because that'd be fantastic uh, sighting to add to our data set. Yep. Great. Um, and I think that's it for our questions. So I might hand that back over to Teresa. Thanks, Rich. And uh, thanks, Josh. That was such a great presentation. It was really, really interesting. And I think judging by how many questions everybody had, um, everybody else enjoyed it as well. So thank you. Um, I'd just like to let everybody know that we've got the uh, webinar series is ongoing. So the next one we've got coming up on Thursday, the 20th of August, is we've got a speaker from the Arthur Ryler Institute, and he's going to be talking about native fish and the effects of river flow. Uh, sorry, river regulation on native fish. And then after that, on Thursday, the 3rd of September, 
we have got the Werribee River Keeper talking about management of waterways in the West. So hope to see you back for those two. And usual procedure, you can find the links through the Melbourne Water website, look for expert connections, and then that will give you a link to the event bright page. So just a reminder, the recordings will be made available online and we'll notice, notify you with an email when they become available. And if you have any queries, just a reminder, the Water Watch email address is waterwatch at Melbourne daughter at melbournewater.com.au. And I'd just like to say thank you again to Josh. That was really great. Uh, thank you to everyone that came along today and for su supporting this series. It's, it's just going so well. We're really, really happy with it. And also thanks to my uh, colleagues, Rich and also Elisa, for your, all your support. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Great. Thanks, Teresa.